Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. You like that radio voice? All right. Well, I guess I can get started. Um, this talk is about writing policies for Coup Warden. And to do that, I probably need to tell you what Coup Warden is. So this is the agenda. I'm going to go through who I am. Um, I'm going to talk about what is Coup Warden. I'm going to talk about policies. Um, we're going to go through, uh, I'm not going to demo this, but I do have a lab that you can actually go do this, and I'll talk about that later. And then deploying it, what does that look like? So who I am, uh, this is not me. I know you guys think that, but it is not. My name is Robert Sergia. I am the, I got a new title now, so let me make sure I get it correct. I am the Director of Technical and Community Marketing here at SUSE. Um, and I specialize in cloud native development and cloud operations. And if you want to follow me on Twitter, I post pictures about my dogs and food. So what is Coop Warden? Well, Coop Warden is a CNCF project um, started out of SUSE. And it is a policy engine for Kubernetes with a mission to simplify the adoption of policy as code, right? And we have two target audiences, um, Kubernetes operators, which I probably sort of switched it. Um, policies can be distributed using container registries. Um, you can use your existing infrastructure uh, and processes. And policy developers, people who write policies. Now, with anything we recommend, and I'm going to make sure I, I say this a couple times, th what I'm going to show you is a demo. What I'm going to show you is not production grade. So if you pull my source code and you deploy it, you're on your own, okay? I've said it. And make sure you tell the guys at the Coup Warden team that I did say that. And policy developers allow you to develop your own policies based on the rules that you might need. Now, why do I like this project? Well, back in the Cloud Foundry days, I used to have to manage an instance of Cloud Foundry and my developers would name things inappropriately. So the logs were full of obscenities um, that they thought it was very, very, you're laughing, but they thought it was very funny. And I had no way of doing that. So we were on a level three triage call and um, the error logs were saying, you know, this uh, shit the bed. It, it was not really good for management. So I kind of took to this project. So it's the highlights of Kube Warden. We have Policy Hub. It's on Autofactory right now. Um, it is an open source existing policies that you can download and use. We recommend that that is the first line of what you do when you're using Kubeboard and check and see if it's there. If it's not there, then go and write your own if you'd like it. We support multiple languages such as Rust, Rego, Go, um, and everything is built um, as a WASM. So it's kind of cool because it's you know a production use of WASM that it's really easy to consume. So policies, what is a policy? These are small compiled binaries that do a specific task. We recommend when you are writing a policy to do one thing. It's, you're, you're tempted to put multiple things in there, but we will, we, we will tell you, we've seen customers try to do that. We've seen community members try to do it and it ends badly. We deliver these as WebAssembly binaries and all, Kubernetes, all run within Kubernetes policy server. So how do policies work? Well, you have a user and they want to do something. You have a cluster and that's what they want to do it to. And Kube Warden has uh, the ability to manage things that you would normally do against a cluster. So if you want to create something, update or delete, Kube Warden has policies that interdict that. And if you attempt to do something, it has multiple stages to allow you to either monitor where someone violated a policy and you threw a message out there saying, hey, Nuno over here, he violated the policy. We just want to document it. We don't care. It's okay. You can accept it, right? Kubernetes says, hey, I will, I will accept the change that you want to do to the particular environment or not necessarily change, but you, know, you can basically uh, you know, update it as well. You can reject it, which is easy. So accept, reject. But now we have a functionality which is relatively new. It's called mutate. And the best, thing, the best way to think about mutating is if you have a, a policy that says, hey, you cannot over-provision a pod, right? And we want to set limits to it. You can allow mutate 
and mutate will log what it's doing, but then mutate the request to then bring it down to a particular point where you want to meet acceptable criteria, right? And that's relatively new. So if we were writing our first policy, well, we need to, we need to have an idea, right? And this is, this normally comes with a demo, but I don't, time, time constraints, I'm not able to show you that, but you can do it on your own. But we want a policy that limits the CPU of a container, right? We don't want you to over provision. Um, and again, this is a demo. Please do not put this in production. Okay, said that three times. So to do this, you're gonna need some type of IDE, whether it's Vim, Nano, um, I use VS Code. I recommend the VS Code Rust extension. And then you can install Rust relatively easy, and then you just verify that it's there. And cluster configurations. This is what it takes to install Kuborn. Just a couple commands, and it is up and running. You, there's a Helm chart that you need to make sure you install. Um, and then there's uh, Helm charts for installing the Kuborn policy, the defaults, and the controllers. So to assist with the adoption of this, the Kuborden team created SDKs for all the popular languages. Um, and that gives us the ability to give you a template to work off of. So we use a cargo generate. We have a Kuborden policy um, Rust template. Sorry, it's... Um, and it gives you the ability to scaffold out a project that will give you two files a settings file and a lib file. And that's basically it. That's all you're gonna need to write your own Rust policy. So within our settings, I'm gonna, in this uh, example, I am setting a string for our CPU limits. And then we need to be able to validate that we are getting the settings. Because without settings, is gonna bark, bite, and not allow that. So we have this implementation and we validate that it's there. So that function needs to be there and it needs to run. And I want to make sure that it can find the string for all the settings. And in here, we're basically setting our settings and we're saying, hey, here's a test. And with this test, make sure that I can get and receive my particular settings. Simple enough, but we're writing code coverage. That's always good. So if we look at the policy itself, we want to be able to update it. And to do that, we need to match and pull out what the object it's looking for. And so we're calling it a pod, um, terrible at naming, but we pull that particular validation request from Kuborden. And when it comes in, we can either get the pod. If we don't find that particular object, then we throw an error for it. Now, I talked about the four states that we have. You have mutate, accept, reject, and monitor. In this enumeration, you need to tell Kuborden, or you need to tell Kuborden, you know, your particular response that you want. Now in here, if I accept it, taking it as is, I don't care, I'm not gonna say anything, but if I reject it, I just wanna pass a string to tell you why I'm rejecting this particular policy. And if we're doing a validation on that particular pod, this is what it would look like. You will pull up all the containers, and then you will uh, traverse down to that particular um, container spec. And then it will do a, a check whether it's valid or not, and then the comparison will come back. So when we're doing the validation of the pod itself, we have to have two responses. The first one is accept, and then again, when I talked about the rejection, I wanted to make sure that I pass some type of message that it will log and you know why that your request was rejected. So we wrote a function and this is to ensure that the container is at or under the particular limit. And what it does is it unwraps that particular container object. It does the comparison and it will log anything in there that we want. Now, I put the logging in, it gets noisy after a while. 
If you look at other policies, you will not see the logging that goes in this deep, but because this is a demo application, I put it in there just so you can see it. Now, to test the policy, this is kind of wonky on how we have to do it, but we actually build, build out um, the spec with the API core framework, and then we traverse down to be able to test what this looks like. Now, to build it, rust up, target, add WASM. Um, you need to do this because it doesn't know the, the target build. And then there's a make file in that scaffolding, that cargo scaffold, that gives us the ability to build everything here. And you will get, a re in a release directory, you'll get a, a WASM file that's, you know, whatever, the, we call it pod underscore sizer. And that's it. To deploy this, I would have to take this WASM, push it up to a registry, and then pull it from the registry and deploy it to Kubeboard. And it gets kind of wonky. So with that, we can annotate the policy, which is not no, no longer needed, but I still do it as part of, it's part of the uh, SDK, so I still do this annotation. It does it for you within the build process currently. Um, and then we have a CLI tool it's called KWCTL or KW Cuddle, where we can go down that route. And this is how we test it. And this uses the same engine that, that Kuborden uses when it's actually applying a policy to a cluster to test it. And so within your JSON files, you can put in test parameters that you want to do and then basically mock up what a request would look like to make a change to a particular environment to apply the policy. So it's basically kind of like a nice test harness that's built into there. And it's an easier way to test your um, WASM files and your policies that you're building. Now I mentioned this, if we have a um, policy that we want to deploy, this is a cluster administration policy. That's the registry to my GitHub that I have a policy up and running. Um, you have to put the, uh, settings in there. So I'm saying I, can, I do not want you to mutate. I'm setting it to false, even though I did not put it into the enumeration. But I talked about this earlier. There is a uh, CPU limit in the settings file that we want to set. This is where it is set on the deployment. So when you deploy this, we're setting our CPU limit to one. I don't want you to go above that. Stingy on my clusters. And then you can do a kubectl apply, a particular YAML file that has all that information in it, and it will tell you that the pod size, are, excuse me, was created. And you can deploy to, um, normally this talk comes with a demo, but I, with time I'm not allowed to do that. And then you can do a comparison between one and the other and do those type of testing. Now, because I know that I was time constrained on this one, so I wanted to make sure I gave you guys the ability to do it. I put together a GitHub page that will walk you through step by step in the creation of that. Um, I will give it and we'll send it out afterwards. But this gives you the ability to kind of walk through all of the code that we have, and it'll give you, it'll show you how to do each individual steps, testing it, deploying it, and executing that way. I'm going to take a moment for questions. Not everybody up first. No, nobody. Yeah, actually. <laughs> um, how would you endow exceptions to policy? Because, you know, this is. Can, can you uh, bring the mic a little closer? So I can, I can yep. barely hear you. OK, can you hear me now? Perfect. How would you handle exceptions to policies? Let's say you want to cap everyone at two CPUs max, but mm -hmm. this one service has a good use case to go to three. You can, it, with kubectl allows you to put an override in there. Um, it's not best practice to do that. So we generally say you're blanketly saying no to everybody and then you're making exceptions. When you have that, a drift in your environment like that, when someone re-ups the policy, it's a manual change to it. So for that reason, we'll say, hey, if you're in a, uh, a specific namespace like dev, 
you were locked down. When you get to production, we will give you a separate set of policies that allow you to go beyond that, and then we control it. So I guess the best way to say is there would not be an exception, a separate policy for a different environment or a different namespace to allow you to apply it, because once you, your, your pipelines reapply it, it'll, that exception will be blown away, and then you're going to be like, why isn't this working? I get it. That's a good, good question. Anyone else? Do you have questions? That was your same question? Okay. No one else wants to beat me up? None of my employees? All right, we're good. So there's some additional resources. And again, I will send out this PDF. You guys can come. You can ask me for it. I usually put it on Twitter afterwards. There's some documentation. I do this demo generally with Rancher Desktop. When I'm building policies, I use the, case, the KWCTL to do all of my testing. I don't normally test it that way. But when I'm pulling down policies and I'm applying that and having a, a mapping session of what policies will look like, I will take what my development environment is. I will respec it down onto my Rancher desktop instance. Uh, I have a pretty beefy machine at home. And then I will map out how I want what policies deployed what namespaces. And then I take that and then I will package all that up and then apply that towards uh, my production environment. And that's it. That's all I have. Thank you, guys.